In this video, I'm going to share with you a story that, as I researched further and deeper, it was clearly apparent that finding the bottom line truth of the death of this young lady will most likely never happen. But there is such sadness in this story of how a 16 year old can be found dead, and the amazing number of questions generated behind this story is intriguing. There are even facts of this story that I have seen that mostly aren't answered in my research. Join me for a ride through Strange and Mysterious here at Odd Mysteries Stories. In this video, I've got a story that's as mysterious as it is tragic. I'll reveal details into the life and untimely death of Jeanette De Palma, a 16-year-old from Springfield Township, Union County, New Jersey. Now, let me take you back to around August 7, 1972. This wasn't any ordinary day for Jeanette. Sadly, it was the day she disappeared. And the place she was found six weeks later? A cliff known locally as the Devil's Teeth in Springfield's Hoodale Quarry. Pretty eerie name, right? You might be wondering why all the attention on this case. Well, there were rumors flying around about possible occult activity in the area. The local media went into a frenzy, filling the air with sensational stories. It was the 80s, and you know, satanic panic was in full swing. But here's the kicker. Even after all these years, no one really knows what happened to Jeanette. That's right, her case remains a complete mystery. And here's something that I find different than most stories. There's an organization out there called Justice for Jeanette De Palma. They're dedicated to remembering Jeanette and solving the mystery of her death. It makes you think, doesn't it? The determination to find answers keeping someone's memory alive, that's all powerful stuff. Now, I'm going to ask you to give this story a second thought. Put yourself in that situation part of a story that's remained unsolved for decades. What would you do? It's a heavy question, and I'll try to help you by sharing the known theories. Jeanette Christine De Palma was born on August 3, 1956, in Jersey City, New Jersey. She came into the world as part of a large Italian Catholic family. Picture this, a bustling household with Salvatore and Florence De Palma at the helm, five daughters and three sons. Jeanette wasn't just another face in the crowd. She was a beloved member of this big family. And just a year after she came along, the De Palmas welcomed their eighth and final child, Cynthia. In the mid-1960s, the De Palmas made a big move. They left Roselle, New Jersey for Springfield, swapping their old surroundings for a new upper-middle-class neighborhood. Springfield was idyllic back then, clean and with a touch of strictness about what went on. In 1966, they settled into their new life at 4 Clearview Drive, in a beautiful house with enough room for everyone. The town was growing in the late 60s and early 70s, with a large population of Italian Americans and Jewish families seeking the rural life away from New York City and Long Island, New York. Not everyone in Springfield was welcoming to the growth of their town. Now, despite the lively family size, the De Palmas kept a low profile in Springfield. They weren't the type to throw big block parties or barbecue every weekend. And Jeanette? She was your quintessential teenager of the times. Quiet, yet kind, someone who could crack a joke and light up the room. Her hair was naturally wavy, but like many girls back then, she went to great lengths to straighten it. Straight hair was all the raid. Music was her escape, rock music to be precise. She was just like any other teenager, loving to hang out with friends and go to parties now and then. And yes, like many teens in that era, she hitchhiked. It was just what you did. Jeanette was a teenager at the time, and like as much as many deny this happening in their early years, Jeanette smoked pot and was known on occasion to kiss a boy. But I couldn't find any proof of rumors that she was promiscuous. What was also mentioned is that Jeanette had a serious case of RBF, if you know what that means. You know what I mean? Just look at any pictures that could find of her. It's my opinion that people who didn't know her judged her for her facial appearance, let's say. Jeanette's school life saw a bit of a shift when she transferred from Union Catholic Regional High School to Jonathan Dayton Regional High School during her freshman year. The why remains a mystery, but it was a change she navigated like everything else. By 1972, Jeanette now a junior, was looking forward. She had dreams of attending Trinity Bible Institute in North Dakota after high school. I pause here and wonder, 
What was it like for her growing up in such a vibrant family, yet living in a town that was so different from Roselle? Now, let's add another layer to the story of Jeanette de Palma and her family. This part, it's about change, beliefs, and how they were perceived by those around them. After settling into Springfield, the De Palma family made a significant shift in their lives. They began attending the Assemblies of God Evangel Church in Elizabeth, New Jersey. This wasn't just a once-in-a-while thing. They were there several times a week, fully embracing their new identity as born-again evangelical Christian. Now, picture this. Springfield, a town with a strong Italian Catholic presence, suddenly had a family that didn't fit the usual mold. The De Palma's new faith set them apart, and not in a way that brought them community accolades. Instead, they faced skepticism and outright negativity. Neighbors and fellow churchgoers branded them as weird and rude. There were even whispers, completely unfounded, that they had ties to the mafia. Imagine that a family simply changes their religious beliefs, and suddenly there's talk of the mafia. Jeanette's nephew, Tom Golian sheds some light on this. He says, we were always looked upon as second-class citizens there. That's quite a statement, isn't it? It suggests that the De Palma family's religious shift wasn't just a personal transformation. It was a societal challenge, one that positioned them on the outskirts of their own community. So here's something that came to mind for me. How much did this religious and social isolation affect Jeanette and her family? Were these the undercurrents of misunderstanding that might have followed Jeanette to her tragic end? And let me ask, what do you think about the De Palma's experience with their new community? Have you ever felt like you were on the outside looking in just because you were different? I'd love to hear your stories and thoughts in the comments below. Let me share the details of a particularly pivotal day in Jeanette's life, August 7th, 1972. It was a day that began like many others, but with an unexpected revelation. Jeanette found out from her parents that her cousin Lisa had run away from home, again about a month prior. But this time they had kept it from Jeanette, not wanting to worry her unnecessarily. You can imagine how that might feel, right? Finding out something so significant had been kept from you, well, Jeanette didn't take it well. She felt frustrated and upset, feelings that many of us can relate to when we feel trust is shaken. That very day, plans were already in motion. Jeanette was supposed to hang out with her friend Dale Donahue. But life, as it often does, something threw in a twist. Jeanette called Gail around 11 a.m., saying she couldn't make it because of chores her mom had given her. However, the plot thickens, as they say. Gail later revealed in a 2014 interview that they actually had plans to meet up with two boys they had encountered the night before at Echo Lake Park. Now, Echo Lake Park, for those who don't know, is one of those spots that's perfect for teenagers looking for a bit of freedom, a little slice of the great outdoors in Mountainside, New Jersey. But Jeanette, facing the age-old dilemma of duty versus desire, initially said no. Yet, after some persuasion, she agreed to hitchhike the eight miles to Gail's house, a decision that speaks volumes about the era and freedom, despite the risks associated with hitchhiking. Here's where things take a turn. Around 1.20 p.m., after deciding to meet her friend, Jeanette told her mother she was off to the train station to travel to Berkeley Heights. Her mom offered to drive her instead of Jeanette having to walk the roughly three miles to the train station or the 15-minute drive to her friend's house. Jeanette, being a typical 16-year-old, reminded her mom that she was old enough to handle going to the train station on her own. Telling her mom, quote, I'm 16 years old and I'm old enough to get to the train station on my own. That moment, that goodbye, would mark the last time Jeanette De Palma was seen alive and those were the last words her mother would ever hear from her. The hours ticked by, evening fell, and Jeanette didn't return home. Concern turned to worry worry to fear. By 10 p.m., her parents, Salvatore and Florence, dialed 911, a call that marked the beginning of a long, torturous wait and a series of delayed responses. It wasn't until a full 24 hours later that Jeanette was officially listed as missing. In the days that followed, the De Palmas were torn between hope and despair. Had Jeanette, influenced perhaps by her cousin's actions, decided to run away? 
or was something more sinister at play? With little assistance from the authorities, the family took matters into their own hands, embarking on a desperate search that led nowhere. Now, I want to pause here and ask, can you imagine the pain, the uncertainty, the sheer helplessness? What are your thoughts on how the situation was handled? And what would you do if you were in the De Palma's shoes? For six long weeks after Jeanette's disappearance, her family and friends lived in a state of limbo between hope and despair. But on September 19, 1972, the search came to a tragic end in a way no one could have anticipated. The day began like any other for Grace Treason, a 47-year-old resident living near the Hudale Quarry. While unpacking groceries, she noticed her dog emerging from the nearby woods, something held firmly in its mouth. It looked like a bone, but not the kind you'd find at a butcher shop. A chilling realization hit her. This was a human forearm. Can you imagine making such a discovery? The shock, the horror. Grace's findings prompted an immediate response. Within hours, a search party was scouring the Hudale Quarry area. This place wasn't just any piece of land. It was vast, surrounded by woods, and known for its rugged terrain. Then... Amidst the tension and turmoil, Officer Lowell Hardy made a grim discovery on a dirt road near the under-construction Interstate 78, the upper portion of a human arm. It was a sign, a dire indication that led the police to focus their search in the area. And then the heartbreak. Hidden among thick brush, on a forty-foot cliff, known ominously as the Devil's Teeth, the decaying body of a young girl was found. It was Jeanette, identified by dental records. The 16-year-old who once had dreams, a family, friends, her life was cut tragically short. This moment, this discovery, marked a turning point. A mystery that began with a disappearance ended in a tragedy, leaving more questions than answered. On September 29, 1972, just ten days after the discovery of Jeanette's body, the Elizabeth Daily Journal published an article that would forever change the narrative surrounding her death. The piece suggested that Jeanette's death might be tied to black witchcraft and Satan worship. The claim was based on the interpretation of crime scene photos, suggesting that certain pieces of wood found at the scene were symbols of a ritualistic sacrifice. This article didn't just report, it ignited a firestorm of gossip and rumors that would plague Jeanette's memory and her family for years to come. Can you imagine the impact? A family already devastated by loss now at the center of sensational theory. Amidst this turmoil, Pastor James Tate of the Assemblies of God Evangel Church didn't shy away from the spotlight. In fact, he seemed to embrace it, contributing his own theories to the chaotic mix. In an interview, he suggested that Jeanette might have been kidnapped by Satanists only to meet her end while trying to convert her captors to Christianity. Such statements only fueled the speculative frenzy surrounding the case. But here's where the story takes another twist. According to a review by Weird NJ, a deeper look into the crime scene photos tells a different story. Despite the lurid theories and sensational headlines, there appears to be no concrete evidence of occult activity linked to Jeanette's death. The supposed symbols like crosses made of sticks and a halo of stones around her body, not present in the actual photos, the rumors of animal sacrifices and carved arrows pointing to an altar? Again, no evidence supports these claims. The most that could be found near Jeanette's remains were two decayed tree branches that seemed to have fallen naturally long before the tragic event occurred. The article went on to report a significant shift in the focus of the investigation towards the realms of witchcraft and Satanism. This report suggested that elements found at the scene initially believed incidental were now considered symbols of a dark sacrifice. Imagine the atmosphere at the time, a community gripped by fear, an investigation under the spotlight, and a narrative quickly veering towards the sensational. The article spoke of wood pieces arranged in a manner suggesting occult practices, two pieces allegedly crossed over Jeanette's head, and others framing her body as, quote, like a coffin. But let's pause here. The language used was focused on I guess if you were looking for signs, they were there which highlights the subjective nature of these observations. It shows how interpretations can be swayed by what one expects or wants to see. 
Now, let's bring some clarity to these claims. A closer look, particularly at the crime scene diagram drawn by UCPO investigator Glenn Owens, challenges these sensational reports. The supposed cross made of wood was actually two large logs lying parallel, not crossed, near Jeanette's body. One log was under her right arm, the other beyond her head, debunking the notion of a deliberate symbolic placement. Moreover, the description of logs framing her body like a coffin seems to be more a product of imagination than evidence. The reality, as depicted in Owen's diagram, was far less ominous. Branches that fell naturally in a cluttered, overgrown woodland, creating shapes that were more coincidental than conspiratorial. This brings us to a crucial point in my research, the power of perception and narrative in shaping an investigation. How do you think the initial interpretations and subsequent media coverage influenced public perception and the direction of the inquiry? Were they looking for a mystery to solve or a narrative to sell? So what do we make of this? How do we separate the sensational from the factual, especially when a young girl's life was cut tragically short? Do you believe that the spread of unfounded theories impacted the pursuit of truth in Jeanette's case? In late September of 1972, the investigation took a curious turn. Authorities learned about a man known only as Red. Now Red was something of a mystery man, 46 years old, a caddy at the Baltusrol golf course and living not far from where Jeanette's body was found in a makeshift campsite. But here's where it gets intriguing. Red vanished around the same time Jeanette disappeared. By January 1973, the Springfield Police Department stepped up their efforts, releasing a sketch and a bulletin for a man they referred to as Red Kira. This name might not be accurate, but it's what they had. They wanted to question him in connection to Jeanette's death. Imagine the tension, the whispers in the community as this figure, so closely linked by location and timing, stepped into the limelight. However, Red's story doesn't end with a dramatic arrest or a courtroom showdown. After being located and questioned by detectives, he was released without charge. No evidence tied him to the crime, and he left the area, leaving behind more questions than answers. But wait, there's another twist. Fast forward to... 2014, and enter Richard Cottingham, known as a serial killer who confessed to taking the lives of three teenage girls in the late 1960s in the New York, New Jersey area. For a moment, could history's shadow point to him in Jeanette's case? Yet, the brutal and graphic nature of Cottingham's confirmed crimes didn't align with the circumstances surrounding Jeanette's death, leading investigators to rule him out as a suspect. So, where does this leave us? With Red, we have the shadow of a suspect, a man who fits into the story but fades out just as quickly. And with Cottingham, we see the dark reach of possibility only to find a dead end. As the investigation unfolded, media coverage took a turn towards the sensational. Reports swirled around the theory that Jeanette's death was connected to witchcraft, fueled by rumors and eerie details of the crime scene. Headlines screamed about connections to witchcraft cults and possible coven activities in the area, captivating and terrifying the public. It was rumored that a witch was brought to the scene. Even the Springfield police chief at the time, George Parcell, commented on the bizarre turn the investigation had taken, acknowledging rumors that a witch was brought to the scene to assist with the case, though he admitted to knowing nothing concrete. Then he was quoted in the article as saying, I heard that some people from the department supposedly brought a witch out there supposedly to help with the investigation, but I know nothing about it, he said. This sensationalism begs the question, how did these theories and allegations affect the investigation and the public perception of Jeanette's tragic death? How do we separate fact from fiction in a case surrounded by so much speculation? Here are some alternative theories in the Jeanette De Palma case that challenge previous notions and shed light on different possibilities. One theory that emerged was the possibility that Jeanette might have been accidentally shot, given her body's proximity to the Springfield Police Department's nearby shooting range. It's a chilling thought, but could a tragic accident have been misconstrued as something more sinister? Then there's the drug overdose theory. 
It's been speculated that Jeanette could have overdosed, a theory supported by nothing more than whispers and hearsay, as no drugs were found near her body, and she wasn't known to be involved with heavy drug use. Intriguingly, her toxicology report highlighted an unusually high amount of lead in her system. However, experts like Dr. Judy Melanek suggest this could be attributed to the environment where her body was discovered, not drug use. Adding to the complexity, Springfield police once floated the idea that Jeanette might have died from an overdose at a supposed party spot in the woods. However, this theory is contradicted by recent analyses of the death scene. The area, far from being a typical teenage hangout, was heavily overgrown, secluded, and showed no signs of social activity as revealed in photographs and reports released in February 2021. Another theory posits that Jeanette's death was the result of a tragic encounter while hitchhiking, a common but risky practice at the time. This wrong place, wrong time scenario contrasts starkly with the sensationalized narratives of cult activities. Lastly, despite previous assumptions about the cause of death, the medical examiner could not conclusively rule out strangulation, adding yet another layer of ambiguity to the case. These recent insights challenge us to think critically about the narratives we accept and the assumptions we make. What are your thoughts on these alternative theories? Do they change your perception of the Jeanette De Palma case at all? In a turn of events filled with persistence and determination, Florence De Palma, devastated by years of inaction, decided to hire a private investigator in November 1981. Sadly, their attempts to uncover new information were met with silence as efforts to gain access to Jeanette's files were consistently declined or ignored. For a long time, the Springfield Police Department maintained that all records prior to 1995 were lost or destroyed during the devastating Hurricane Floyd in 1999. The narrative took a significant turn when the editors of Weird New Jersey, along with Jesse Pollock, co-author of Death on the Devil's Teeth, and Jeanette's nephew, Ray, embarked on their own investigation. Despite initial resistance and claims of lost files by local police, their persistence paid off in a surprising way. After years of denials and dead ends, Pollock's diligent efforts led to a breakthrough. In 2019, he successfully consulted with former UCPO Director of Communications, Mark Spivy, to file a request under the New Jersey Open Public Records Act and the Freedom of Information Act. This was a game changer. Despite delays due to COVID-19 and personnel changes, the bulk of Jeanette De Palma's case file was finally released to Pollack in February 2021. The contents of these files were revelatory. The long speculated occult activity, the supposed symbols of witchcraft surrounding Jeanette's body were not present. Crime scene photos, once described as missing by officials, were devoid of the alleged crosses made from sticks and twigs and halo of stone. The narrative that had been built around Jeanette's death was crumbling. Moreover, no signs of animal sacrifices, another element of the whispered rumors, were found. The only items even remotely resembling the speculated symbols were two decayed tree branches, fallen naturally and long before the tragic event occurred. No arrows carved in trees or any sort of altar were visible in the photographs. This revelation challenges the sensational theories that have overshadowed Jeanette's story for decades. It brings to light the importance of persistence in seeking the truth and the impact of thorough investigation. As I reflect on these developments, I invite you to share your thoughts on this story. The FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia, indicated in their findings that the only body hairs found inside of Jeanette's panties were her own, insinuating that a sexual assault most likely didn't occur. Despite this, the stains in her clothing were too decomposed for conclusive blood and semen examination. A quote from the patrolman that found the body said, Somebody had to be with her at the time because she had on flip-flops, he further said. And I had hiking boots on and I had had trouble getting up that little hill up to where she was laying. He said there could have been more than one person with her because with flip-flops, she would have had a hell of a time getting up that hill. Schwert, who rose through the ranks to lieutenant before retirement, said police knew that some of the kids who hung around with Jeanette were known to be, quote, drug addict. What is noted in the recently released reports, however, are the contents of Jeanette's purse 
and the revelation that it was apparently never recovered, despite previous accounts given to us by the responding officers on that day. Approximately eight feet south of Jeanette's remains were the contents of her purse, apparently dumped out into one small pile. Listed in the evidence reports and shown in corresponding photos are a pack of Markle tissues, a Vix inhaler, a small compact lipstick, a comb, a key on a ring, a clear vial with an unknown substance resembling a coruscidin bottle. Jeanette's mother, Florence De Palma, told the press that her daughter had a mild cold on the day she vanished and a small eyeshadow box. What is absent, however, is Jeanette's purse itself, along with any money or a wallet. If Jeanette was murdered, it is now apparent that her killer took her purse and her cross necklace, possibly as souvenirs. The cross necklace was widely reported by her family to have been missing from her body and corroborated by the reports released in February 2021. We now know that her purse was never recovered. But, as with most revelations in this case, more questions have arisen. Why were her cross necklace and purse stolen from her body? This is just a strange observation that I made, and it seems in my research isn't addressed or even considered suspicious. It said that a Dalmatian dog brought back an arm that it had found back to its owner. My question is this, if the location of the body was way up that cliff and out of plain sight, so much so that a policeman mentioned he had a hard time accessing the location, how far out of sight was that dog from its owner? And how did the dog manage to get up on top of that cliff? From all my research, getting to where her body was found was no easy task. The policeman that found the body said he was wearing boots and reported getting to the location was challenging. Another fact is that Jeanette was either barefoot or possibly only wearing a pair of flip-flops which were found near the body. As far as I could find, there wasn't any other way to access the top of the cliff, or was there? I assume not. So. I would think she would have had to have been lured up there while she was alive. There is no freaking way someone dragged her body up there after murdering her, in my opinion. I'm thinking the perpetrator might have said something like, hey, let's go smoke a joint up there, and or convinced her that the view from up there was really cool and worth the trek. Then once they got her up there, they assaulted her. And yes, I know that law enforcement didn't find evidence of that, but I think that's the most likely scenario because forensics were just not as good at the time. Also, the body was so badly decomposed when found, it's reasonable to expect how investigators couldn't determine stab marks or even a pass-through bullet wound that might have caused her to bleed out, one that didn't strike bone. I don't think it was animal predation at all that in my mind is out of the question. That's just my theories. It's a shame that we will most likely never know the truth of what happened to her. I sincerely hope that you, young Jeanette, rest in eternal peace. I found this to be quite an interesting and intriguing story and hope you did too. From what you have now heard, do you have your own thoughts or theories on this case? Share them with me in the comments. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this video and are enjoying the videos on my channel. My name is Vince, and if possible, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. I'll be posting new videos at least once a week. Clicking the little bell will send you a notification when a new video is posted. In the meantime, I invite you to watch one of my other two videos on your screen. Thank you.